All right, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Stephanie Kim, and yeah, I'm gonna be talking about how to become um, a more productive and efficient data scientist by kind of taking some of the tips and tricks from the software engineering world. Well, my clicker did work, but now it doesn't, so I will have to do this manually. All right, a little bit about me. Um, I use Python, R, to do data analysis, some machine learning projects, uh, specifically uh, natural language processing uh, work, kind of looking at feedback form data and any kind of user data to get some insights about user, um, the user interface, where people are having problems with. Um, I done some ETL at my old job at Apollo Education Group. I founded Seattle PyLadies location. I um, am currently the organizer of Seattle Building Intelligent Applications Meetup. So um, it's a group just trying to, you know, kind of come together and figure out how do we can make smart applications together. And I'm um, a developer evangelist at Algorithmia. So just a little bit about where I'm at right now at Algorithmia. Uh, we're a common API for algorithms, functions, and models that run as scalable microservices. So we're powered by a great community of developers, researchers, and organizations that all contribute to the platform to make the marketplace uh, just really robust and have state of the our algorithms accessible and discoverable by everyone. So you can think of this as the bridge between the researchers who create the algorithms and the developers who want to consume them. So we have more than 2,500 algorithms that run as containerized microservices and kind of think of them as Lego building blocks of algorithmic intelligence that developers can use to you know, create, share, and remix at scale. We have a ton of utility algorithms such as scrapers, file converters, um, to deep learning algorithms such as nudity detection, profanity detection, and video processing pipelines so you don't have to build those pipelines yourself. Um, for data scientists or any kind of algorithm developer, uh, you can host your algorithm um, and you can host your data and pickled model for free and you wrap that in a function and we turn it into a scalable API endpoint for you in just a few lines of code and you have CPU or GPU machines available to you. You can open source your algorithms um, or you can make it private to consume it yourselves within your organization or you can um, monetize your publicly available algorithms. So what, what is a, uh, a 10x developer? So it's someone who is literally 10 times more productive than the average developer. It means not only can someone produce more code per hour than the average developer, but they produce less bugs, right? Um, they, they also mentor, they write documentation, they have a lot of broad skills that go beyond just knowing how to code. Uh, brief history, so behind this idea, um, so in 1968, Sackman, Erickson, and Grant um, created a study uh, they looked at programmers who had an average of seven years experience and they discovered there was a broad range of time that it took um, each of them to complete a code assignment. Um, and later there were more studies done that kind of found the same thing. So even though some, you know, these people had about the same, you know, level of experience in years and background, uh, there were wide ranges of uh, time it took to do the same coding assignment. So there is some controversy about this study, uh, about whether these types of developers really exist. Um, people often say, oh, hey, you know, a woman can't produce a baby and, you know, 10 women can't produce a baby in one month. But um, it's not a linear process. Coding isn't a linear process. Uh, I especially like an analogy from uh, the the article, The 10X Developer is Not a Myth, um, where the author gives an example of Sherlock Holmes being the equivalent of 10 average detectives. Uh, but we're not gonna focus on the debate whether or not it exists. I've, I've met developers who are much more productive uh, than your average developer on a team. And so I'm going to you know, give you the, what I've learned, what I've learned you know, from other people, and then of course, um, different articles on how to be more productive as a developer and apply those to the data science workflow. So hopefully by the end of this talk, uh, you will 
uh, walk away with definitely some of those skills and um, be as productive as these kitties. Uh, we're going to cover at a high level project design, like what it means to, you know, maybe step back and, and look at the project holistically before you dive in and write any code. Um, we're going to look at tricks of code design to be more efficient and productive. Uh, which tools for the job might help, you know, you be faster. And, you know, just briefly going over productionizing your model. Um, it's a skill that not all of us have, but it can, you know, round out your, your toolkit to, um, to make you more efficient, productive, and viable, and, you know, as there's more data scientists out there in the job market. So project design. Um, the first couple tenets are knowing the business domain and understanding the question uh, that stakeholders are asking, uh, understanding the goals. So knowing the business domain, whether you're in education, biotech, finance, it's, it doesn't mean that you have to know all the ins and outs of what that business does, but you should understand what factors could change the outcome of a data model by understanding the business at a high level. So an obvious example would be to understand how different factors affect sales volume. So you might be improperly interpreting sales volume if you're ignoring some factors such as weather um, as an independent variable in your analysis. And maybe you're only looking at discounts and other marketing uh, effect, uh, efforts that affect sales volume. So say you've got like a food truck, you know, and you're trying to optimize for location and in that example, if you don't account for the weather, you're not going to have a very strong model. It's just a very basic example. So more importantly than understanding the business domain, however, is understanding the data. How it was extracted, um, wh when it was extracted, by whom, what biases there might be, um, are there gaps in the data, what features could be used and what might be missing, and other um, you might have other data sources within the company that you could potentially add to create a more accurate model. And so, kind of leads us to the next point. Um, it's understand the ask, but it's also talk to people. Talk to people within you know, the, the team, across teams, and learn from one another, because you, you might be able to understand more about not only the data, but the, the goals of the business. So ask questions. You should understand um, what the business owner or product manager is asking for. Uh, one of the biggest things of any you know, project is understanding what the business owners um, are asking you to do because they might not know themselves. They might have heard some cool, you know, term that, you know, uh, their competitor, you know, oh, they're using that model or, oh, they've got a recommendation. We've, we need that. So you need to ask questions and learn what are you actually trying to achieve um, with this. So it's important to, you know, have that, have that in documentation so you can um, re reference it and so you can really solidify your own conceptual model about what the, the goals are of the business. So how, does, how do these make you a 10x data scientist? So you'll first, the first tenet of like that great productive developer that we're talking about is they only want to do the work that needs to be done. Developers are lazy, right? They don't want to do more than they have to. And so by stepping back, um, you really get a good idea about what work needs to be done and what you, you can actually skip. Um, you can also find misunderstandings between uh, what you know the business owner thinks they need and and you know what you say they you know okay well maybe this isn't the best thing for you have you tried this and and sometimes we're caught in the trap of just wanting to build something cool because we want to learn how to do it but to be more productive and more efficient you really should take a step back and say okay well what does this mean to the business. So, and again, you'll just solidify your own conceptual model by taking a step back before you write any code and learning, you know, what, what the goal is. So, um, the next um, idea is code design. This is probably the biggest section of the talk um, with some code snippets, so uh, bear with me, but um, I guess I, I have a little bit of 
beef with some data science uh, scripts that I've worked on, and um, particularly our users uh, don't don't always have the best code. Uh, they don't follow the best practices or coding principles. So uh, the first one is clarity beats being clever. So this means try to avoid that nested dict comprehension with a list comp within the list comprehension with some you know. Um, conditions. Keep it simple. Keep it flat. So in this Scala example, um, you've got the first one is a, you know, we're, we're just using sort by method. No big deal. But all three of these examples do the same thing. But the first one, your brain has to really think through each step like, okay, what does any of this mean? Um, and so it takes a little bit longer to read through. But, you know, I mean, if you've been using Scala forever, you're like, okay, the underscore is a shorthand for an argument name and an anonymous function. Yeah, yeah, I got that. But you still have to think through it. Uh, the second example at least uses an argument name. Um, it's showing assignment. And we can see that sorting, you know, by the next to last element in the sequence x. But I'm gonna get crazy and go for the less abstracted uh, naming convention and use a name that represents what my data is. So close count. And so the third example, you immediately know what it's doing, what data it's referring to, and it's just a lot faster to comprehend what's going on, especially when you haven't looked at the code for a while. Which kind of leads us to naming things matters, and it's hard. Um, so just using these rules of thumb, of thumb use, um, use naming conventions found in your spec, in your language spec, like Pepe, um, Data science actually is pretty good about this because most, most people will use uh, the conventions uh, like say model, the variable names model, fit, predicted. And people are pretty good about following those conventions, but I highly recommend you do because your grandma should be able to figure out what you're referring to. So instead of the sequence X, you'll want to say usernames. You want it to represent the data. So. This is going to make you more productive because debugging is faster. Refactoring code goes by way faster, especially, again, because you probably haven't looked at your code for a while. And your team members will love you because they don't have to go through line by line and try to figure out what your code represents. Um, this one's real brief. Just be consistent in your code. So, um, don't use both camel case and you know or snake case. Don't use both in the same script. But this goes beyond just um, in the same script. It goes you know think of your um, think of each piece of code as your you know name stamped on it. And so you want it consistent. You want to be able to go from one project to the next and have your naming conventions uh, the same across the board. You want to have your documentation similar from project to project. Because again, it just speeds up um, you know, thinking through what is happening in your code. Um, so this is my beef with R users. Uh, nobody uses functions but please use them. They're really handy. You can't have testable code without functions. You will have tons of global variables, and you will have code that repeats itself often. So they should be small functions that just do one thing. And you should abstract your functions to, so you can reuse them. So it follows the developer convention of dry, don't repeat yourself. And again, it'll speed up your de development time a lot. So this one's not as well known, even amongst developers, but I have worked under some incredible developers who, in, before they sit down and actually like write the real code, they use code stubs. Um, and so it's kind of a way to think through what you're doing, what your project is doing, what the input and outputs are, um, what you need to return, and it'll help you avoid spaghetti code. So 
documentation and comments, uh, so doc strings and comments are really important. So obviously it helps yourself and others know what um, each function does, but there's uh, something that I actually recently learned within the last year that there are different libraries and most languages available where you can actually turn your doc strings into um, readme documentation. So Python, there's the library Sphinx. So if you hate writing documentation, the very least you could do is um, just use a library to convert um, your doc strings and comments into documentation. Now, if it's for a larger project, um, definitely have your documentation and you know a more solid form, whether it's you know readme, a wiki, whatever you want to do, read the docs. Um, but it's easier for yourself and others. And honestly, your teammates will still be talking about you after you leave the company if you have well-documented code. Um, another, um, I guess, particular, uh, Python developers are pretty good. You know, they, they do exception handling. Um, but again, our users, I'm going to poke it at you guys wherever you are. Um, please use exception handling. Um, you're going, you know, I don't care if you um, just raise an exception and put a, you know, like a helpful error message. You're going to debug your code so much faster. You're, um, again, people who come in after you are going to be um, amazed that you've uh, taken the trouble to actually handle your errors. And users, um, they need those errors. They need helpful error messages to tell them what's going wrong. So this is the old function that I wrote for like a year ago. Um, this, at least it's in a function, right? So there's comments. There is some exception handling. But um, just quickly looking at it, I can see that it could have been broken up into two different functions. Um, it could, it should be in a, there should be a function that just creates a plot. and and then there should be a separate function uh, that uploads that file. So it doesn't take a whole lot of time. And again, it just really helps you create testable code that's easy to read and easy to understand. And this isn't a real popular one for anybody. <laughs> Whether you're a developer or a data scientist, uh, developers are a little bit uh, more known to do this. Um, but write unit tests. You should know what your code is supposed to return, and you should test that. Any kind of change you make later on, if it breaks the test, you'll catch that before QA does. And everyone will think you're amazing and this bug-free you know, creator of these wonderful models because you've taken the time to test your own code. This particular example is from the Hitchhiker's Guide to Python, and it uses the Python testing library PyTest, but there's a ton of others. I've used Nose. Very, very easy to use. All right, so the right tools for the job. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of hesitancy, I've noticed, um, for data scientists to uh, use, say, pre-trained models um, or other APIs that, um, because they like to create the model themselves. That's their job. That's your job, you know? And so if you're using some pre-trained model, then, you know, maybe you just feel like, okay, I'm, I, you know, could be like obsolete in, you know, X amount of years. But developers have been doing this forever, you know, whether it's, you know, Stack Overflow helping you out um, and you're just copying and pasting some code um, or just using a helpful library or API. Don't reinvent the wheel. Don't think that you have to build every single thing yourself. So say you have some Twitter data and you need sentiment analysis. Um, there are trained models out there for you to use. So you could train your own model, you could label it and train it, um, or you could just utilize a pre-trained model. And it's not gonna work for every case. But something like social media analysis, there are a lot of useful libraries out there. Um, so automation tools, like I'm pretty sure we've all written a bash script and you know we've automated that with a cron job and you, you know, getting out some reports and quick and dirty. 
but after you spend some time trying to debug a report that was written by someone else, maybe who's left the company, um, it's automated and you don't know where the job is even running on, what machine it's running from. Um, so luckily there are better ways. So you could use Puppet, Chef, Ansible um, to help schedule your jobs in a centralized location. So Chef has a little bit of a steeper learning curve and it's kind of labeled as you know a, um, more of an administrative tool, a DevOps tool. Um, Puppet, you would need to probably learn either Ruby or Puppet DSL for the CLI commands that you would need to um, use to run your jobs. But Ansible is written in Python. It, it uses YAML commands, but it's not as mature as the others. It doesn't have like quite the, the you know, solid community and, and probably not as many like tutorials and community help, but it's definitely um, more user friendly. So developers know their environment. They know it in and out. Um, so whether it's Python environment, you're using virtual environments, or using you know, Conda, um, or you're using SBT for Scala builds, um, or you, you know, you've got your Java. Um, they even know the databases, like, okay, well, am I using, uh, am I, you know, extracting data for Mongo um, or a SQL database like Postgres? So they really know the ins and outs of their environment. And so they're able to debug stuff themselves. They're able to set up faster. And, um, you know, there aren't always um, problems that come up that are in your code, it might be some dependency. And they know how to you know, fix that. So whether it's installing an Oracle driver on a Mac, knowing all the environment variables you have to create, or installing matplotlib on a Mac, certain versions don't show the, uh, the plot um, immediately. So you know, just knowing the ins and outs of the environment that you're working in. And, and honestly, I'm gonna you know, shout out to Vim because there's nothing that's faster than just opening up Vim for a really quick uh, code edit and a script. But you want a full-fledged IDE if you're you know, working on bigger projects. Uh, I personally like, these, these are kind of my three favorite. So I'll use R Studio obviously for R, um, IntelliJ for whether it's Scala or Java or Rust. Um, I've been known to touch pretty much every everyone so um, that one's great and then again vim for really quick like you know fixes and changes in your scripts whether it's a bash script or a python script so this one's a little bit looser of a topic um, these are you know kind of extras that are you know that either i read about or that i've learned from talking to really proficient developers um, so one of them is simply pattern matching, pa pattern matching. So this comes from experience. And it's just simply no, like having dealt with a similar problem before, but text developers are able to um, understand and see, you know, like that, oh, there's some similarity within this problem and I have dealt with this before and hey, we can, you know, use this example to do this. And so it's just, it makes you a little bit faster. And again, that one is a little bit hard because it just comes with the years of hard one experience. Um, the second one is learn to how to explain your code to yourself and others. So it's important to like, everybody knows whiteboarding, you know, interviews are, are horrible, but they're, you know, very common. And you need to learn how to explain your code, but also, you know, whether you're doing pair programming or code reviews, you need to be able to understand what you wrote and not just know that that's what Stack Overflow said to do. So get used to talking about your code, explaining it, um, and then, you know, sometimes that will, you will catch your own errors. Um, I, you know, whether you you buy a developer deck, you know, on Amazon and just set it on your, you know, table and tell the deck what you wrote or, you know, you get someone else and explain it. It definitely is worth doing. 
practicing. Uh, this one, I personally have a hard time doing, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, but you have to learn how to, and when to quit and start over with, with something. So whether you, um, you figured it out or you heard about a model that um, does whatever you're trying to accomplish a lot faster than, and than what you started using, it's okay to quit and start over. Um, you, it, it's again hard to abandon that work, but if, you, if you've actually saved yourself time in the long run by, okay, say this, this way is gonna take me two weeks to do, but if I keep going down this bad path that I'm on, it's gonna take, you know, like a month. So don't be afraid to start over and just toss away your code. And this one is probably um, one of the, the best that I've seen from really proficient developers. They've got their own stock of gist. So they've got all these little code snippets that they know they've used, um, problems that they've run into time and time again. And it'll definitely speed up your workflow. Um, if you've got a well-organized stock of code that you can go back to, and, and this goes, I mean, sure, I might have like some scripts that do something similar, you know, but kind of condensing them and organizing them in one place is definitely worth your time. So take a weekend and just go through all your code and take things that you've, you know, run into before and definitely make uh, your own stock. So not a lot of data scientists that at least I've talked to have actually productionized their own code. Um, a lot of times you're you know, going to be on a team where you just kind of hand it over. And it's really important to know at least what it takes to productionize your code and what language you use. I mean, are you really going to want to productionize your R code? Or um, after you throw it over to um, the other team, are, are they going to convert that to Python or another language that's more performant? So by, again, talking to other team members uh, or other teams and, and understanding what it will take to get your model in a productionized environment is really important. And people will definitely, um, you know, uh, not only respect you, but they will they will come to you and, and ask, okay, well, you know, how can we, uh, you know, what do we need to do to set up on our ends, and you know, and you can work together. So it's important to kind of learn the language at the very least. So here's just a brief list of some providers for hosting your data models and productionizing your code, because you might end up at a startup where you don't have a team to kind of toss it over the wall to. Um, there's a lot of, I've checked out pretty much all of these, not so much Domino Lab and Continuum, but they, um, they all have their strengths and weaknesses, things that could be deal breakers for you. Um, when you start to look at these different providers are, of course, ease of use. Like some of them take a lot more knowledge and research and understanding to learn how to use them. Um, and then some are just super simple. You're just, you know, like calling an API endpoint if you're just using, you know, one of their pre-trained models. And, you know, others like um, Rackspace, say they um, only have GPUs on, um, they don't have GPUs available in the cloud. So you definitely want to understand, you know, the ins and outs of those. Uh, cost is really important to everybody. So you want to look at what, what are add-ons and what are the built-in costs of like the virtual machine that you're using. Um, some charge you for hosting data, some don't. So definitely check out, you know, if you've got huge um, files and models, uh, that could get pretty expensive. So also some, are, uh, some will lock you in um, to only using their platform. And a lot of us like our own tools and we don't want to just use like one particular um, vendor for, one, for everything. So another one, uh, do they have the language that you use? And that's really important. Um, last time I checked, like um, Google Cloud ML, they had um, TensorFlow models only for deep learning. 
and um, I believe they only had a couple languages available, but it was including Python. Um, I know Azure ML has Python and R, and so you know you really should understand like, okay, do they support everything I need? So ha again, like. Tell, being able to tell a story with your data is great, but you should understand like where it's going after you create your model. So, I mean, I think most of us probably don't feel like we're going to be 10x developers anytime soon, like Richard from Silicon Valley. Um, most of us probably feel more like we're a little bit like big head, but that's okay. We're getting there. So um, again, just to summarize, like you should understand what tools you can use for the job. Even if you're not building the model yourself, it's okay to not reinvent the wheel. Use, you know, train models if um, it makes sense for you, your use case. Um, become a master of your chosen environment. And that means like, yeah, you're gonna have to know, you know, all about the dependencies and environment variables and all the yucky stuff that, you know, you don't wanna touch. Um, you should plan ahead and, and not only in your project design, but in your code design as well. And you should especially understand the business request and, and maybe you won't end up building anything at all. Maybe it's not a data science um, problem that needs to be solved by you. Maybe it needs to go to another team. And again, that's okay. Um, you don't have to take it all on yourself to do, um, especially if it's not furthering the business goals. They will appreciate it and you'll, you know, be working on things that are important to the business. Um, and again, just, you know, learn at least at a high level, what it means to put your model in production, because that will affect your decisions on what language you use. Say you know, you know, Python and, and R, or you know Spark, or you're wanting to learn Spark, and you're realizing that you know you need real-time streaming data, and so knowing kind of like what you know your project is going to be used for will definitely affect your decisions. So I harassed somebody at um, Jake. Uh, keynote and asked to take a picture of the back of his shirt um, because uh, I think it was from PyCon this year or something. But anyway, um, it's PEP20, the Zen of Python. And yes, I did ask. I didn't just sneak and take the picture. Um, but I was like, oh my gosh, this totally encapsulates everything I'm trying to, you know, like help bridge, you know, from the developer world to the data scientists. So beautiful is better than ugly. Um, so that kind of goes to the, the clarity, the clean cleanness um, versus cleverness. Uh, explicit is better than implicit. Uh, simple is better than complex. Complex is better than complicated. And it goes on. Flat is better than nested. Remember, I mean, I love my nested list comprehensions like anyone else. I, I can read them, you know, very clearly once I write them and then, you know, Two months later, I go back and I'm like, oh gosh, this, I, I need to just break this out. Um, so it just goes on, readability counts. Um, and it goes on to talk about Python specific rules, but I think most developers kind of try at least to, to follow um, these tenets. So uh, a little thank you. Um, so, I gave, I'm giving you guys a promo code for Algorithmia to sign up if you want to use it. It gives you $50 uh, free credits. Um, thank you for coming. I think I speeded uh, along uh, pretty quick. So we have some time for questions, um, if anyone has any. Thanks, Stephanie. <laughs> any questions? <laughs> questions? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so one of the suggestions you made was making a, a, your own stock of GIS. Um, so how, how exactly would you go about organizing that and storing them and, and where? That's a good question. <laughs> it, uh, the question was about um, how would you go about organizing and storing your GIS? So 
Um, I just use GitHub Gist, um, but it's not the best way to organize things always because there's not, um, it, it doesn't cleanly, you know, organize them into topics or something. So I don't have a good answer for you. I'm definitely not the most organized person. I'm like, you know, creative chaos. But uh, if any of you have uh, some trick that you use to organize your gist, feel free to speak up. And um, but yeah, I don't. I unfortunately don't have an answer to that question because they are kind of like in this sea of gists, and I'm like, oh geez, what's data science and what's Front end development and what's back end development? So that's a good question. Um, you can I will look into that for you. And uh, my email is Stephanie at Algorithmia. So you can email me that question too, and I can uh, talk to team members and see if they use anything better than GitHub. Um, I just wanted to say real quick, I'm working on kind of doing something like that. Um, I like to make decorators and uh, just a few different Python scripts here and there and just push it to a library, maybe put it on pip, just so I like have access to my like external brain of things that I spent time doing in the past. Awesome. So maybe that'll help out. Hi, um, you uh, mentioned something about um, uh, exception handling, um, and I was wondering if you could maybe expand on some best practices for that, because I often find myself when I try to do something like that, I, you know, imagine all kinds of cases and, you know, type checking and stuff, and it's like, wow, I'm spending more time writing this than I probably would be saving debugging or something like that. Sure, so. sure. So the question was on exception handling, um, making it clean and concise instead of just, you know, this huge line, of, you know, line after line of different, trying to handle all these different exceptions. So um, there's a couple ways of doing that. Um, so you can use, like, just say if you're using Python, you can use, you know, just all the exception handling, um, whether it's like input output exception. But I actually tend to like um, the library that I'm using, using their exception handling, because it tends to give you a lot um, cleaner exceptions. And uh, again, the only way to really avoid like that is to go to using functions, making them small, making them only do one thing and one thing only, because then you're only writing exception, you know, for like one thing. And that's the best way to handle that. And again, that means you're going to um, be able to test that code as well, because if you've got a function doing multiple things, it's not really testable. Hi, Stephanie, thank you very much. Um, just wondering, do you have any suggestion about um, establishing your business case and getting buy-in on your projects? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, so he asked about getting, um, if I have any suggestions on getting buy-in to specific projects that you're wanting to do, is that correct? Um, yeah, um, it depends on where you're working. Um, bigger companies, you have to jump through a lot more hoops. I would suggest creating a presentation and, um, and doing the research yourself and maybe even doing a little bit of the code on the weekends, which I know is kind of, feels weird, but um, it shows that you're committed to it. It shows that you've thought of the different um, problems that you might face, um, but it also shows the business owners, what solutions it solves, and and the fact that you're taking initiative um, really makes you know people happy. If you're working at a startup like me, it's a lot easier. You know, I could just pull my CEO aside and be like, "Hey, I've got this idea, and it could solve this problem. And can I do it?" And you know, it's you get a lot more immediate feedback, and you're able to kind of you know take risks, I feel, a little bit easier. Because I've worked at both. Apollo Education was a large company. Algorithm is a small startup. So, but in, in, it is, so again, it depends upon uh, on what your uh, environment is like. But either case, again, creating the deck, doing that research yourself, and showing, you know, and doing a lunchtime, like a brown bag talk, um, especially if you're working at a larger company. That definitely, that showing the initiative, a lot of times, you know, that's all it takes for people to sign off on stuff, so. 
I think we have time for one last question. And seeing none. Oh. Um, so you mentioned earlier knowing when to start over is kind of hard. Um, I've struggled with that too. Um, but I was wondering if you can maybe elaborate maybe what makes it hard. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. So he asked about, you know, my feelings about, you know, starting over um, and maybe some tricks to, to actually do that. Um, so, yeah, starting over is hard because you've, you've committed, you've invested emotionally and in just time into whatever you're doing. And sometimes it's hard to, you know, pull over off that road because of the commitment of your time and energy and emotion. And nobody likes to be wrong either. And it's okay to be wrong and say, uh, you know what? This isn't the right way to do it. And whether it was someone else kind of coming in and going, hey, this might work better or whatnot, or if it was your you know, idea to, um, and your research that found something better. Um, it's, it, it, nobody likes to be wrong, but I think that's something we all have to get over, egoless programming, and, and be okay with being wrong and, and taking a, a step back and saying, okay, um, uh, there are better ways to do this. And again, sometimes that just means you need to take a break and walk away from the code itself and think, okay, what, what's the way the pros and cons? You know, if I keep going down this road, is it gonna be really faster in the long run? Or did I find a faster way to do it? And um, I'm a regular, you know, purger of my environment. I get, I delete stuff all the time on my desktop. I get rid of stuff at home. I encourage you to practice that in your life, really, because it it's, it makes your practice of you know just scrapping code that you spent like you know two weeks writing a little easier if you're used to doing that in other parts of your life. So. Thank you, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, guys.